All right, so we're starting with the first section of art theory for matric. Um, and there are six sections for the year. We need to prepare for six of them and you will answer the best five at the end of the year. It's gonna be very predictable this year. I've summarized the notes for you. I've put it into bullet point and I've also outlined what needs to be read only and what needs to be studied by heart or in greater detail. So hopefully that'll all help and we must um, not look at theory as something that is a insurmountable mountain, but something that links very conspicuously with the prac, which is important in, in its link to the prac, and also something that uh, we can do predictably very well in because it is a predictable exam and we will be very well prepared for it. So uh, without further ado, the first section that we're doing is called the Emerging Black Artists. So it's artists that rose out of the townships in the 1950s and 1960s. And as with each section, we'll be looking at two artworks in detail from each section um, in order to better understand what they were saying. And then there will be unprepared examples around that as well, where, where you'll be given artworks by the examiners that you've never seen before, and you'll be asked to apply your skills of art theory and able to be, uh, visual and be able to visually analyze the artworks break them down into smaller components and in doing so gain a greater understanding. Because as we've discussed before, um, a big amateur move when you look at an artwork is to make a judgment as to whether you like the artwork or dislike the artwork. Um, that is irrelevant. What is important is whether you understand the message that is being conveyed to you by the artist. Because in doing so, you're able to better understand the world, you're better able to understand how people see things from different perspectives and that is an invaluable survival skill to have in this modern landscape. So, uh, in preparing you for this, the, the first thing that we need to be aware of is that these artists came within the framework of a part state. And one of the necessary evils of, of maintaining an oppressive, in, unjust, unequal systems is that you need to subjugate the people that you want to have ruling control over. And you need to make them themselves see themselves as second class citizens so that the system can run almost seamlessly without much opposition. And one of the effective ways the apartheid government subjugated black people and made them feel inferior was by um, saying that their art was inferior, pointing out their art in comparison to the achievements of their peers in, in white South Africans and pointing out that it was inferior. No such thing as inferior art. There's art that's made from, from different circumstances, for different means. There's art that's been, um, has a whole range of motivations. But to apply the term better or worse to art is, um, is a meaningless term. But in answering that question and also in pointing out that it, that it is um, an unfair statement that they did, we're going to look at some artists that are celebrated by the same culture that's subjugated and derided the township art at the time. And so, yeah, the perfect example for this is Vincent van Gogh, held as, as one of the geniuses to come out of Europe. We note from, from this painting of his night cafe that he has sat at, at the cafe itself and he has painted everything from life. It's a very brave thing to do. It's one thing to go to, say, Stones, take a photo and then go sit at home and, and work in a very... Uh, safe contained environment maybe use projectors and other means of technology and also your image never moves as well because it's a photograph um, and if you've taken it in great detail you'll be able to replicate the scene in great detail and so visually it'll be very convincing but you do lose a lot along the way and what you do lose along the way of being so clinical and divorced from the environment that you're depicting is you lose a lot of nuance and you lose a lot of feeling and it might sound a bit strange but the ability to engage other senses visually with your painting and this is remarkably achieved here by, by Van Gogh who sat in the, in the environment and painted from life bearing in mind it was very groundbreaking what he was doing at the time so he would also have people uh, looking over his shoulder continuously and telling him what a terrible artist he is and that he should give up so even in the face of adversity in the face of, of um, no meaning, meaningful encouragement, no motivation outside the artwork himself, uh, he carried on, and that's why he's revered as, as such an important artist. 
But what is quite important to note is that there are distortions where, when you sit and you paint things from, from life and you don't make careful uh, preliminary drawings and you don't make photographs. And it's important to know in your, in your own process that these distortions are inevitable and in many ways they can add to an artwork as much as they can detract. So things we'll notice here is the linear perspective, things getting uh, smaller as they're further away and bigger as they're closer, is out of kilter here. This, um, this table, if it was drawn properly in linear perspective, would look something like that, okay? So, sorry, just without that big circle. So that would be more accurate linear perspective with the, with the table coming down there. Um, also, if you look at the size of this figure here and the size of these figures here, they're quite similar in size as well. Um, if you look at the arrangement of the chairs down in the corner here, it also doesn't look like very planned, like a photograph would be. Also, if we look at the, at the window through there, that's not a very convincing reality. And also, if you look at the lights here, um, they're, they're actually reflecting that, that golden light out, which they wouldn't do in reality. There's also a very similar yellow here, 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 here. So, so there's no nuance of color. And, and also, when we're in, a, in reality, color is um, not as bright as this in reality. So these, these are noticeable distortions that happen when you paint from life. Whether you're a township artist in apartheid South Africa in the 50s and 60s, or if you are a revered genius from Europe in the late 1800s. Other things that happen from life, just to grossly contrast that, so you sit in an environment and you're creating an, an environment of propaganda. And um, th this in no way belittles any Christian belief system um, or speaks of my belief system. This artwork, no matter what your, what your principles and your, and your belief system is, is an artwork of propaganda. It is there to sell Christianity, and it is there to sell Christianity from a specific angle. So if you can imagine, Christ is on the cross. Um, he has been crucified. He's had nails, nine-inch nails driven through his hands and his feet. Uh, he's been flogged. He's been beaten, and he is going to hang there till he dies. But this painting was made in Southern Renaissance Italy. And so you can see from the environment that the artist is very divorced from the experience. If you contrast it with the experience that's going down in the night cafe in the slide before, in terms of uh, Jesus being punctured there um, by a spear, by a soldier. And also the blood is dripping here from his nails. And quite unsympathetically, these angels are beneath Jesus gathering his blood into chalices to drink from it, like it's wine. Um, also, con uh, to show the divorceness from the, from the situation of the artist, you know, this, this is Jesus' mother. She does not look sad at all. She's looking up, kind of hopeful, like, oh, yeah, finally the day's come. This is a good day. And then we have this lady here that stares out looking a little bit bored. So this is the kind of artwork that's made by people that have very little empathy in life, very little... Um, relatable experience to suffering. So when they depict suffering, they depict it like it's a wine party. Then we also have other um, 20th century modern art revelations, such as Matisse here, with his Madame Matisse with green stripe, where the colors are unnaturalistic, it's flat decoratively applied, applied paint. Bearing in mind a lot of these revolutions or, or revelations, sorry, is a better term for it, by these modern 20th century white European artists were founded on African art pr principles. And for the first time, looking at African art, not from a, from a position of superiority, but looking at them from a position of peers and learning from them. And I think in our mindset, that is very important to note, that whether you're part of the African culture, whether you're part of the European culture, or you're part of an... Um, an Asian culture or a, a combination culture, wherever culture you come from, there's no better or worse. There's actually no superior or inferior. There's differences. And when you open your perspective up to those differences, you can learn and improve your own life. Similarly, um, German expressionist art, very visible brush strokes, um, unnaturalistic color application. If you look, this lady's face is green, the street is pink etc etc these are all influences of african tradition 
divorcing oneself from naturalism in order to depict a reality that is depicts more senses than one. So this is what a traditional white artwork looks like from South African times in the in the early 20th century. So very very important that the artist still maintain that it's beautiful landscape, but even more conspicuously that it's always very quietly populated landscape by maybe one white settlement. Here we see again unpopulated landscape, the land of opportunity. Traditional African painting is quite the contrary, whereas the those sort of European paintings it was very important to show landscape and, and make it seem like those landscapes were vacant, like they weren't intruding on any land and that there were no natural inhabitants there at the time. At the same time, African culture is, is um, celebrating its cultural identity. Now, if you cast your mind back to grade 10 and you remember one, one of the characteristics of traditional African art is that there's no individual identity. Individual identity is not celebrated. So we can't tell who's, um, who's who in the zoo here if, uh, from the tribe because they all look the same, because they're all peers, they're all equals, and it's not important what their individual identities are. It's more important what their cultural identity is. Also on top of that, if you look at the background, the landscape is irrelevant because this is seen to be an eternal scene that happens anywhere, at any time, with anybody combining into the scene. So the cultural identity is celebrated in a timeless landscape. And the center of African art is this humanism, this human struggle, this, this notion of unpicking spirituality, unpicking what, what the inner consciousness is of people. This is first and foremost in their minds. Again, we'll see the ladies here, and yes, there's a bit of individual identity expressed in their dress, but we see them from behind, and so we can't tell who is who, and they're all doing very similar activities in very similar dress. Again, celebrating a cultural identity. So we're going to move on to the two prepared examples. So it's important to note that you, as we're going through the notes, you'll see an RO above um, certain sections. That means read only in order to gain an understanding of the section. doesn't mean ignore it completely. And BH, that means study those bullet points by heart. For each prepared example, you'll be asked to give six points plus the title of the artwork in order to do very well. And if you're able to do that for both artworks in each section, you can predictably get 100% for half of the paper. Sounds easy? Yeah, it uh, takes a bit of graph for sure, but it's uh, not rocket science. Okay, so just to get, give you a flavor for Sakota, this is not a prepared example. This is one of his artworks called Yellow Houses. And so you see it's a typically township scene. It's important to note that these artists did not have access to the same sort of uh, educational privilege as their white peers. They didn't have access to the same resources. They didn't have access to the same amount of time um, because their paintings were not being sold for uh, lots of money. Uh, they did not have the same access to emotional stability and comfort because it was a much more difficult time for them. And so when we're looking back at art, is it important that we only look back at artists that had really nice materials, lots of time to do it, and had no hardship in their life, so they were able to sit calmly for, let's say, 10 hours a day and produce these amazing, delicate, detailed paintings? Of course not. If we're looking at art, we're looking through a range of human experiences. And so it's become very important, especially in hindsight, for us to look back at apartheid, this difficult time for people, through the eyes of artists like Sokoto, in able to not just know what happened, but also to be able to feel what happened. And so one of the popular questions that comes up in the unseen examples, and um, I'll, I'll keep explaining this to you, so if, if you miss what I mean by the unseen prepared examples, it will be drilled into your head until it becomes second nature and you understand, is they will ask you, especially in this first section of emerging artists, to be able to visually analyze artworks and one of the things they're looking at is how the artworks are distorted. So we would look at things like the fact that there is some atmospheric perspective and that 
that is getting more faded and less contrast between light and dark as you move further away and blues are getting picked up in the shadows for sure um, but yeah there, there are a lot of conspicuous distortions here so these houses are all exactly the same color um, and although I am aware that houses get painted the same color in many places they would never be exactly the same color because the nuance of atmospheric perspective would make that slightly bluer that one less so and that one the least blue okay some of the other distortions that have happened here is obviously the coloration on the grass here it's in order to make it a bit prettier a bit brighter because it is a dusty desolate area there's um, nice evidence of movement as well as these figures move along but in order to express that sense of movement a lot of detail has been removed from them so it seems like if you cast your mind back to the impressionists an impression of the scene that has been created Similarly with street scene here, it's more about the mood that is being conveyed. And again, bearing in mind that during this time, the, the regime of the apartheid government, so the, the white government was expressing that townships were dangerous places to be, filled with dangerous wild savages. And so scenes of quiet reflection by, by artists like Sokoto, where he shows that a woman can stand outside and hold her baby and be supported by the community. That there's a golden glow to the area. That although these people have very little resources and very little access to um, monetary comfort, they're still living in harmony. The Shabin, again, so capturing all aspects of life and, and just giving, which is quite different from uh, traditional African art, He's starting to celebrate the individual identities through their clothing, through their posture, through their mood. And then also, and this is what he's been heavily criticized for, is doing it in a way that seems idealistic. In that this, this is probably prettier than a Shabin would have been. It wouldn't have had these uh, dynamic purples being complemented by these yellow colors. So things like that make it more attractive. The reason why he did that is because he was compelled to sell his artworks, but he also wanted to bring dignity back to the township. Do you understand that if you're in a place and you've got no escape from it, it's no point telling everyone, oh, you live in the, in the worst possible place all the time. You need some people to celebrate your dignity and go, look, it's terrible. We're repressed. We're in a terrible environment. It's out of our control. But within that, we can find dignity. We can find kindness. Um, we can find respect for each other. Things that can never be taken away from us. And so that was his overriding message. Similarly, the prison yard, you'll see um, one of the characteristics of Sakoda's style is you've got the, the white man who is in separate uniform from the rest of the black community, who are often seen to be um, together and facing the hardship together. Okay, this is the prepared example. You need to know this title, Song of the Pick. And you need to know that it is by Sokoto, spelled like that. So, without further ado, let's go check it out. So, this is a Song of the Pick by Sokoto. It's our first prepared example. So, as we go through the bullet points, here are some of the bullet points. So, this man here is a white poor man, and he's an onlooker. And he is passive, his hands are in his pockets, and he's smoking a pipe. So, he's not doing anything. He is seen to be... The person watching over the labor. Then we have this row of black workers in a strong, strong diagonal lines are created. Of course, by the linear perspective. But what it also does is it, as we know from, from what diagonal lines do, it creates a dramatic sense of movement. Bearing in mind that Sakoda's paintings were targeted at a white audience because those were the people who had access to the resources and the money in order to buy the artworks. And so what Sakoda did was very clever, is that he used to hide a lot of messages in his artworks. So if you're the apartheid government, you could actually have this as a propaganda poster for apartheid. You can go, this is, this is the ideal South Africa. We've got in less numbers, we've got white people um, 
And I'm not saying this is my political views, of course, because it's a very warped, distorted view. I'm telling you what the apartheid view was. The white intellectual onlooker providing the brains to the operation and then the larger population of black people providing the labor. So this seems to show apartheid in a good light. And on top of that, you've got um, beautiful colors. You've got ground, which is normally um, brown, uh, which now has all these nice violets and pinks and it's being complemented very nicely by the yellows back there as well. But what's happening simultaneously on top of that is Sakota's going, look, we work hard, and although we work together, that's why no individual identities are shown there, their faces are turned away from the camera, there is some individual identity in their clothing being different. So I'm getting a bit addicted to circling everything, I think, I'll, uh, I'll hold back on that. So, yeah, so the individual identity is still being celebrated through their clothes. The title, Song of the Pick, already should be evoking a notion in your mind that these guys are doing it to a song. So they're working in unison and harmony, and they're doing it with a sense of dignity um, and a sense of duty. So now we move into some of the hidden symbols. So they're working with these picks, and... You know, the apartheid government's not going to rush in and arrest Sokoto for showing a whole lot of black people working very hard with their picks. But what it is, if you look on um, the flag of the Union Soviet Socialist Republic, which is what Russia was when it was still communist, or the Chinese flag, which is still communist to this day, this pick is a, is a symbol of communism. It's a symbol of hard labor and working together towards a common goal. And communism was the enemy of apartheid because communism implies that everyone is equal and that everything should be shared equally. Also, on top of this, so very unthreatening to the white person because this foreman, so just to circle again, is standing on his own, very unthreatened, very passive, watching these other guys work. But there's nothing stopping them from all working together and striking him down. And if you just slightly change your perspective from this, you can see it from dual perspectives. You can see it as someone having control over this um, almost machine, uh, metaphor for machine that these black workers have become. But you can also switch your mind to see this machine, these black workers, as raised, ready, working in unison, and striking down the foreman and overthrowing his power. Okay, second prepared example. George Pember and his artwork is called Terror and he holds back a lot less. He paints a far more devastating version of apartheid. So I think the first thing that needs to be recognized is this is a, a very intellectual painting. Um, and I get quite upset a lot of the time when I, when I teach this to matric classes because um, often, not the whole class, of course, but at least one individual will think that uh, George Pember didn't intend all of these things. Um, he did. He was um, a strong intellectual and he studied artworks vigorously. And although he didn't have access to formal education of art, he took the intuition to do a lot of that on his own. So let's look at a few things. So these guys here... They're in uniform. They are seen to be the police because they're in, in uniform and they're blue and they're armed. So the police are, are supposed to be there to protect you, but they're doing the exact opposite. They are attacking unarmed people in a train. So it would be instantly recognizable as well, and, and this is thankfully before your memory, but certainly during my memory, when I was at school, there used to be first class and third class carriages and only first class carriages were only available to white people and third class carriages were only available to people of color. Um, and they were different. There was much nicer seating in first class and uh, bucket seating in, in third class. Where's second class, you might ask? Yeah, they wanted to separate people that much that they pretended like there was a second class even though there isn't a second class. Just there is first class or third class. Those are the only two options. So they're in a third class train carriage. So that is definitely not the place for police to be gunning people down. It's a claustrophobic, contained environment. But Pemba does show 
that there is some hope, if you look at these windows and the view that's going outside there, that there is some escape. Um, just not for these people, but, but he has imbued it with some sense of optimism. This main figure that's standing here, he's very conspicuous because he's wearing a white shirt. So, that, so that's um, already highlights him in the picture. It also enables us to easily see that he has been shot and he's got blood spilling from there. So he is the central figure. He is the focal point. His arms are spread out like they're in the crucifix pose. If you'll notice, so does the person to his right and so does the person to his left, which is very similar to how Jesus was crucified on the cross with a person on either side of him. Similarly, we have a lady underneath there wailing and mourning his death. Very similar to how in traditional European depictions, Mary is overcome with grief at seeing her son being crucified. Also, his white shirt is a symbol of innocence. The fact that his arms are raised shows that he is surrendering, that he has no point being aggressive. Then at the same time, his hat flies off. This is reminiscent of a halo. So again, it references traditional European art that celebrates Jesus as a martyr, someone that died for a greater cause than himself, and suggesting that this man has done the same. There's also the dome that happens as the train room, which is again very reminiscent of the dome from a church. And then we have the two white lights lifting up from his hand, suggesting that this man will ascend into heaven. This is his spirit leaving his body. It's visually linked to his shirt. He's been shot and it's ascending. So Pemba had strong Christian beliefs um, and he is calling out white people for, for saying, you know, the, this narrative that is supposed to drive your whole culture and society. You are the perpetrators and the evil on, on the side of this. So again, it's very important when, when you're trying to bring about change to get the white people on board as well as um, people of color that are being oppressed so that the system can change as rapidly and peacefully as possible. Also importantly, this painting references Goya's painting that we looked at in grade 10 as a prepared example, the 3rd of May. You can see the similarities, white shirt, arms raised, light that represents his spirit being visually linked to what he is, and then the church at the, at the back showing the ascension up to heaven. So he is referencing again a traditional European painting that is seen as um, a European symbol of, of resistance art. Looking at some of his other examples as well, so we move on from that uh, terror, sorry, which is the prepared example, and that you'll need to know six bullet points, um, which I've listed some of them now, all of them actually. Um, and then we're just looking just to get a, a flavor uh, and, and to sort of give you a, a background for some of your unprepared examples. So we have political unrest, and again, uh, Pemba really likening this to um, the Christian scene of Jesus being led to his crucifixion. So one of the nasty things that used to happen during the apartheid times is, you know, people were continually plotting to overthrow the government in, in townships. Um, that's natural because they were being oppressed. But they would also get um, pimped, for lack of a better word, told on. Um, by some people within the community to the cops in order to gain some sort of um, financial favor or, or maybe some other favor. And so the people that were found to be informers to the police, they were dealt with, for lack of a better word, rather savagely in the township. So they, they would be taken, this tire would be placed around their arms so that they couldn't move, it would be doused in petrol and they would be set on fire. So this is this figure being led very willingly by the rest of the people in the townships, they're all throwing stones at him to show that, um, that the system of apartheid also caused a lot of black on black violence. Train scene, every once in a while even Pemba stepped out of the, the violence and the oppression of the situation to bring dignity to his people. Um, because they, they were a community, they were a community that, that served each other, that sometimes laughed even in the, in the face of adversity, stuck together, dressed with dignity, dressed with pride, and woke up each day to make the world a better place, like we all do. 
All right, so that, that is an abbreviated version of the first theory lesson. Um, well done for making it all the way through. I hope uh, a lot of it made sense. Um, if something doesn't make sense, please have a look through the notes. If um, you're still a bit confused, then by all means, please uh, send me a little WhatsApp or make a comment on Google Classroom. Um, email is my, my least preferred form of communication with students just because um, that's where I get my most spam. So it's uh, my most sort of cluttered mind space. So I like to deal with um, what I like to call the nonsense of life. And you guys will never be the nonsense of life. So get hold of me on my WhatsApp or Google Classroom rather, please. Um, and obviously it's easier for me to respond on WhatsApp uh, with a voice note as well. It's much quicker than typing out a, a three-minute feedback. Okay, lovely. Have a good day.